Delighted to say I'm joined today by a colleague of mine, Steve Rayner. Uh, Steve has been a change consultant for over 30 years, working with some of the world's best known companies, helping leaders successfully transform their businesses. His clients have included Boeing, Harley-Davidson, IBM, Lord Corporation, Microsoft, Mubadala, Otsuka, and P Puget Sound Energy. Rayner is the author of seven books on topics related to corporate transformation, leadership, and high performance work systems. He is the founder of Rayner and Associates Inc. and co-founder of the startup firm, Ascension Transformation Solutions. From 2017 to 2019, Steve took time out from his consulting practice and joined, joined Lord Corporation as Director of Leadership and Organization Development to see the transformation he had helped start as a consultant through to its conclusion. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, Steve, welcome. And of course, you and I have worked together over the past year or more as well. So it's a great privilege and a joy for me to be talking with you about this. But you've just written the story of the transformation of the Lord Corporation between 2017 and 2019. And I wondered if we could just kick off this conversation by your telling us how that actually started, how you started working at Lord. Yeah, uh, thank you, Nick, and it's great to be with you. Um, the situation at Lord was that uh, a board member um, whom we'd worked with, myself and Bill Belgard, who was a colleague on this project with me, we had worked with before uh, when he has been an executive with another company, and he recommended us to the CEO, Ed Oslander of Lord, and wanted us to begin to work with the company. I, at that time, had never heard of uh, Lord Corporation, knew nothing about them, um, thought, are we, am I about to embark on working with God Almighty? I mean, I did, knew nothing literally about the company. And so I began to learn more and more about the organization and found that Lord uh, was uh, founded by Hugh Lord back in the 1920s. And they had gotten into sort of vibration control uh, solutions and were you know, very Im important company during World War II for American aircraft using the Lord engine mount systems and uh, had continued this long history of uh, successful products in really two areas, one around adhesives and materials and another around vibration control systems. And uh, I got very intrigued by the, the possibility of working with them. And then uh, in September of uh, 2016, uh, Bill and I got fully engaged uh, working with Lord Corporation. So, uh a sort of historic company, a great heritage company. Um, what was it about your skill set that got you pulled into the uh, the Lord story? At that time, um, Lord had not grown for the last uh, two years. A very profitable. This is a very interesting situation. A very profitable company, highly profitable, no growth in terms of the top line uh, for a couple of years, and the CEO. Um, I think first recognized the importance of growth. The board wasn't fully on board yet. I mean, the fact that the company was consistently providing great dividends and uh, it was a privately held company, so it didn't have some of the pressures that a public company might have. Uh, but there was more and more discussion about how do we create growth in the company? And that's really was why we were called in. We were called in to help Lord figure out the growth problem. And so the goal was how do we achieve sustained profitable growth? And the projection for 2016 was actually a decline in overall sales. And it was looking like 2017 um, was not going to be uh, much better when we uh, first got engaged. Now I've had the, um, the privilege of having read your story. I mean, the story of this transformation. And of course we're going to be uh, putting it up on the website here so people will be able to read that uh, and I urge them to because it is a fascinating dissection of how you, Steve, and, and abetted by your colleague uh, Bill Belgard, of course, uh, go about your business. Before we get into the story of your involvement in that Lord um, transformation, 
tell me a little bit about you, Steve, and, and how you got from, uh, from there to here. And in other words, how you started out in, in your work life and, uh, and the years leading up to your involvement with Lord. Yeah, you know, a pivotal event for me was actually right out of uh, university and I was uh, got a position as a project historian for a new plant that was being start up, started up in Forest Grove, Oregon. And this new plant was using very innovative management techniques as part of its startup. And that's why they wanted a historian. They wanted someone to actually document the whole process and what happened at this facility. And uh, that uh, led to me getting very interested in, in you know, very uh, unique and sophisticated management approaches. At that time, we called it participative management or socio-technical systems. And uh, through the years, I uh, began, uh, began to apply some of these ideas, went on to uh, get my uh, graduate degree in organization development, and then started a consulting company looking at this. And so through the years, I've been really focused at how do you create change in organizations that can lead to better results for both the human aspect, the people in the organization, as well as business results for the organization itself. And uh, through the years, I've had the opportunity, as you mentioned in the introduction, to work with uh, some really fantastic companies such as Harley Davidson, uh, companies like IBM, um, companies like Lord Corporation, that were really trying to do some very innovative things and uh, trying to really move the needle in what was possible in those organizations. Now, of course, um, you're a storyteller. I mean, you're a you're a, a strategic storyteller. You tell the stories of companies that are uh, going through change, and you use story as a component in that process. Um, how did you derive that model, Steve? Uh, and how did it uh, take you from that sort of early work that you did with some of those companies that you've just mentioned into where you are now with your storytelling based transformative process? Yeah, the, you know, Nick, as you know, I mean, the power of the story is truly extraordinary and it can have a huge impact in the way people think about their organization and what they're trying to achieve. And one of the things that, uh, like a lot of ideas one has, it was in resistance to some things that I saw actually happening in companies. I saw this tendency to people to call a vision, um, something that would be a one sentence kind of uh, description. And uh, any kind of real thing that could be done or measured or understood. And so I began to play around with the idea of creating comprehensive visions. And uh, basically the idea was that a vision needed to describe a specific point in the future. And that point in the future needed to be described in a way that was uh, systemic. So it included how people would behave, it included how the organization would operate, it included the results that would be achieved, but really a complete picture of that total organization. And the third thing was it needed to be written as if that future had already happened, as if we were in the future looking backward at the past. And uh, what I soon discovered was that uh, these, these visions, and, and initially when I first started doing this, sometimes these, these documents would be 30 pages, 40 pages in length describing the future in that kind of detail. Uh, I soon discovered that people uh, really grabbed onto that because it was a possibility. It, it didn't worry about the as is condition. It looked at what we could achieve and it helped align people to a new way of thinking and a new way of progressing. And uh, today, those visions are typically uh, just on a single page of paper with key ideas about what we're going to achieve in the future. But that was a centerpiece. It was also a centerpiece in the Lord transformation. It was one of the key uh, pieces that we created. And then from that, once you have that collective awareness of that future, what we're trying to achieve and what it looks like, you can begin to really focus on other elements of storytelling that are important. And, and one of those elements is inspiration, you know, to inspire people to really try to do things. And you can pull out people that are doing it in the organization as examples to help perpetuate the culture. And a lot of times when you talk about these kinds of changes, and this is certainly the case at Lord Corporation, under the old system, before the change, before the vision, before the transformation began, 
people that were kind of the ne'er-do-wells, the ones that were kind of operating outside the laws and norms of the corporation, uh, sometimes uh, were considered bad actors. And under the new system, some of these same people are considered the exact opposite. They're considered the, the ones that, you know, refused to follow company policy to the T because they were too busy spending time with customers trying to better understand the market or trying to better sell the product. And so uh, you make heroes out of these people that further uh, strengthens the momentum connected with the change. People see it in a very tangible way about what we're trying to achieve. So let's cut back now to the Lord story itself. Um, what was it about your process that they wanted or felt would be applicable to getting them back on track? Um, or was it the other way around? Was it, was it you proactively suggesting to them that there was something in your uh, uh, approach to this uh, transformative process that you felt would work for them? Yeah, it was, in the case of Lord, it was, it was, I almost call, I oftentimes call this the perfect transformation because there was such extraordinary alignment between the board, the executive team, the CEO, the directors of the company, um, myself as a consultant into the organization, we were really aligned to what um, we were trying to achieve and do. And so the process was very engaged and very involved uh, throughout. So uh, initially, uh, as an example, um, Bill Belgard and I interviewed something like 70 people in the company to get a full understanding of kind of the issues and what was happening. And two, two documents came out of that. One was called the Lord Report, which provided clarity about what we saw as some of the key and core issues that were affecting their ability to grow. And as part of that document, we actually outlined what we believed uh, Lord needed to become great at in order to achieve sustained growth and what the implications were on its culture. So how, how will its culture support growth and what needs to change in its culture? And one of the kind of stunning findings from the report was really that it was the culture that was holding the company back more than any other single issue. Um, it was things like slow response time that was you know, considered acceptable. It was a lack of customer intimacy to the uh, extent that you know, was possible. There were great pockets of examples of things that were doing, being done very well uh, within the company and we highlighted those as well as examples. And then the second key document as I already talked about was the vision, this comprehensive vision of what the future uh, could look like. And then we held a series of workshops to refine the thinking, to get clarity and get everybody on board around the vision and what we're trying to achieve and then develop that into a series of implementation plans and uh, begin the, the process of actually executing on the change. So let's get a little granular then about the, the storytelling process within that. Um, can you give me any examples of, of, of sort of narrative techniques that you employed and deployed that actually, you know, exemplify what we're talking about here? Yeah, so, so um, one, of, one of the examples uh, that uh, had a very, I think, a very profound effect, there's a couple of, I think, really good examples uh, that had a really profound effect. Um, one of the Lord policies at the time was that a, um, uh, a sales representative had to have a certain type of car and that was a limitation. And so one of the uh, Lord businesses was in oil and gas and they were trying to deliver these products to the customer that had been developed. And the only way they could de deliver them because of their physical size was using the pickup truck that the sales rep personally owned. And um, the CEO and myself, we, we, I actually learned about this during the course of the interviews. And then Bill and I recommended to the CEO, wow, you know, this would be a great time to, to change that policy, make a big deal about changing that policy because we are trying to be focused on the customer. So uh, Ed Oslander, the CEO actually showed up with a brand new truck to hand to this uh, individual that was uh, the sales rep that was out there delivering these materials. And uh, it became you know, part of a, a story. And then we made it, we, obviously we documented that and, and spread that across the company, but it became a, a very simple example of what we were trying to achieve uh, going forward in the organization. 
Uh, another thing we did, there was this, this team within Lord that had um, broken you know, records in terms of the development time for a new product. So as part of the leadership training, we actually had the whole team in front of the room and had a case study that uh, I wrote that actually took them through the case in three pieces about what had happened. And uh, the audience, there's about 70 of leaders within the company there, um, would read the first part of the case, discuss how they would react, and then they would get to hear directly from the person that actually did it what happened and what, why they did what they did and what the reason was. And uh, it was a very successful case. So it, it became um, motivational both in this is what we can do as a company, this articulates the culture we're trying to create, and it's motivational to me because I want to be on the stage next year giving being the case study a representation of what we were able to achieve and do. So those are you know, a couple of simple examples, but the, the idea is that we use the experience within the company as we're going through the transformation to actually demonstrate the new culture that we want to have and reinforce that. And uh, within Lord, there were a number of great examples of this that we were able to utilize throughout the, throughout the process. And they just grew and grew. We got more and more examples. The momentum just increased. And uh, the change just became, you know, an accepted part of what we were trying to do and trying to achieve. One of the things I just find so powerful about the model that you devised is this idea of the sort of the future story. You know, it's writing the future as if it's already arrived. And, you know, as I know, you know, psychologists just know the power of this. And they will tell their patients and their clients that, you know, if you can imagine yourself in five years time and then write that future as if it's already arrived, you know, Nick or Steve or whoever, you know, that is a way of pulling you into the future. Um, because the brain, as we know, is very, um, it, it is bad at distinguishing the imagination from reality. So it's just such a powerful tool. Um, I wondered, Steve, how did you formulate that? I mean, what, what gave you the idea for that future story uh, telling model? You know, originally um, it, it was much the way you just actually described it. It, it was the recognition that in, in sports, uh, in uh, uh, activities where we're trying to improve ourselves, one of the tools that we can have is actually a positive visualization of us in the future. So if, if I'm a world-class downhill skier, you know, before the race, you'll, and you'll see this in the Olympics, they'll be visualizing that course in their mind before they actually go through it. And they're imagining it in as much detail as possible. They're predicting which turn, how they're gonna come into the turn, how they're gonna come out of the turn, the speed they're going to be going through, uh, what areas to be on the lookout for. So it's a rehearsal in their head of what they want to achieve. And we see the same thing, you know, and visualization around trying to improve relationships or visualization trying to improve your career. And so the idea was, could we take that concept and apply it to organizations? So can we get a visualization that collectively everybody agrees to and can support? And then we can create and unleash a tremendous amount of energy uh, you know, on the positive things that can this organization can do and achieve. And we've got a map about what it will look like. We know what we're trying to achieve. And uh, it, it just became very powerful. But the actual basis of it was this idea of visualization on an individual level and then thinking about how it could be applied collectively and to an organizational setting. Well, uh, let's just now talk a little bit about how it actually transcended in practice and how the the storytelling, the techniques that you um, employed and deployed with Lord actually then transformed the company. I mean, we were talking, I think, about a time frame between 2017 and 2019. So how did, what was the sort of the rough time scale of this all rippling through the com company and how did it end up? Yeah, and, and it actually began in September of 2016. That's when the, the consulting portion of this project uh, began, um, we conducted, the first thing we did was conduct the interviews, which lasted about, uh, about four weeks, something like that. And then um, the Lord report was written and the vision document, the first draft of the vision document was written. And then we had a series of workshops. So by January of 2017, 
we had a clear, uh, well-articulated vision. We had actually developed uh, into um, some teams around each of the key areas that we're going to pursue around growth. And the implementation planning was beginning to happen uh, at that point. So, you know, really in time frame, the uh, initial phase of this was very, very fast. And um, I, should, I should actually sort of jump forward too and, and just talk about some of the results that were achieved. So we get this vision in place, we begin to implement things. And some of the things that some of the changes are, are pretty significant that are happening. We, we now have um, a company that historically had operated almost like a university in terms of their R&D, um, kind of pursuing just things that were of great interest to the engineering staff where they thought there might be a market, to engineers now actually going out with sales reps and meeting with customers to understand in more detail what the customers want from the product. And in one case, in one market area, we actually uh, saw a decline in the number of projects uh, we we're focusing on because we learned very quickly that the customers weren't interested in something like 90% of the individual projects that were going on. And so as projects, the number of projects that the engineering group was actually working on decreased, the revenue increased, which you know seems counterintuitive, but if you're working on the right things, that's the result that you'll get. Um, so um, introduced a new sales uh, process uh, there, had a, had a vice president of sales that came that, that was new to the organization as part of developing the whole commercial excellence capabilities within the company. So all these things are, all these things are happening. And then by uh, 2000 and uh, the end of 2018, um, the company had grown from that period of time from 2017 through the end of 2018 by 20% in a market where uh, you know, an annual growth rate of three to 4% is considered outstanding. So 20% growth, 70% increase in profitability. Uh, so as you can see, it's a phenomenal uh, change in impact. And another thing I, I think is really relevant to our conversation today, uh, Nick, is that a lot of this growth happened in adjacent markets. So it, it, it wasn't as if uh, Lord was, came up with a new product that was completely new and different and took the market by storm. It was really looking at what are the adjacent markets that we can get into and really have an impact on and uh, use our known technology, but maybe use it in a new and different way to address a specific customer need. And you know, one of the keys to that obviously is to really understand your customer needs. But another thing that was key to this was rapid prototyping, coming out quickly with uh, products that we could test and customers could check out and get their hands on and tell us if that was gonna work or not, and then go back to the lab and come out with another one. So it was this whole kind of mindset change that allowed um, so many of these changes to occur. Well, as you've just said, we've, um we've employed some of this uh, technique ourselves, you know, through you and uh, the work that you've been doing with uh, NCW and the call to action that we've been engaged in this year, um, which is of course about uh, seeking to more deeply engage the aerospace and defense sector in addressing global challenges, you know, starting with climate change, but leading into other pressing challenges like, uh, food and water security and, and, and sort of environmental degradation, et cetera. And, and to an extent, we've been doing some of this, of course, ourselves, Steve, which is writing the future as if it's happened, imagining an aerospace and defense sector that is already fully engaged in uh, the uh, global challenge uh, solutions arena. Um, how, how do you think, uh, your techniques, the techniques that you've derived and developed, could uh, be implemented more widely in the aerospace and defense sector. Yeah, I, you know, um, it's it's funny because actually some of the original work in, in putting this whole methodology together actually began in the uh, aerospace and defense uh, sector to help them address some specific uh, issues and problems. In particular, uh, a lot of work that um, I've done through the years with Boeing. Um, so it's, it's absolutely applicable. Uh, and when, when I look at 
when I look at um, the aerospace and defense sector right now today, given you know our situation, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. Um, I think there's going to be a change and when we come out of this pandemic, it's not as if we're going to go back to the way we were before. We are changed. We are changed as a society. We're changed as a people. We're changed as a world uh, in many ways. And um, I, I believe that there'll be uh, a need to really rethink how the businesses operate, particularly in that sector. Uh, you know, with the uh, issues that are going around, around global, global issues, pandemic issues, you know, we're about to, in the United States, we're about to lose more people um, to COVID than we lost during World War II, which is an astounding number to think about. But, you know, a, a national defense issue is pandemics. A national defense issue is global warming. A national defense issue is, you know, cyber attacks. And these are things that we not necessarily have ne traditionally thought about in that context. And uh, I think that um, that's going to change. And I, I think we need to be open to rethinking how we think about defense. And on the aerospace side, I mean, uh, the commercial side, the, the effects of the pandemic on people traveling, and is that going to rebound? It may not rebound. So, you know, what are the adjacencies that these large aerospace companies can take to continue their growth while facing a very different world of, of ridership, you know, on their, on their planes and aircraft and sales of those aircraft. Uh, I think it's gonna take some real leadership. It's gonna take someone really thinking about what could be possible and really having a vision and utilizing a process like this, really having a vision about what is possible and how these different pieces could fit together to create a better future and one that can also be profitable for our organization. And I, I, so I think it's absolutely uh, very timely and uh, very important um, that those kinds of conversations you know, begin today, or if they're not already happening in those organizations, they begin and they begin to get very serious about it because it's a different world than we faced uh, before this pandemic. Well, I think you, you know, absolutely hit the nail on the head there, you know, and we tend very much to think of the aerospace and defense industry as a nuts and bolts industry. Of course, it's evolved on from that. It is now very much a sort of software based industry, but we also tend to think of it very much in science and engineering terms. But what I love about what you've done is opening up the, the imagination through the use of storytelling um and you know of course when we think back to apollo and the moon program i mean president kennedy in a sense did exactly what you've you've yeah. done in you know telling the future uh, of apollo before way before it had happened by setting this goal to get apollo to the moon before the uh, the decade was out um any final thoughts steve on uh on, on sort of how 2021 looks to you and with your vast experience of having story told for aerospace and defense companies in the past. Yeah, you know, how, how do you, how would you like to unfold this technique going forward into 2021 with some of the challenges that we've spoken about? Yeah, uh, um, I think, you know, Nick, that um, one of the things that I'm really hopeful for in, in 2021 is that we do have uh, some conversations about what is possible in addressing these greater global challenges and how companies need to take a role in that. We're, we're seeing some things that um, I, I, I think are, are, are significant today. Um, you know, recently uh, General Motors, for example, uh, decided that they are going to adhere to the California uh, emission standards. Uh, and, and that's a, you know, a great example of a company taking a very different position than they have historically to try to have a, have a positive impact. And one might be cynical and say, well, that's good PR, but it's also, I think, an indication that the mindset in some of these issues has begun to change. And, and companies need to take leadership positions and begin to look at how they can begin to actually address some of these issues. And there is, I think, money to be made in these adjacent markets that can actually have an impact on improving our chances of survival as a species 
I mean, it really gets down to that in some ways. If uh, they can apply these technologies to, you know, help us solve some of these, these global problems and issues uh, that we face. And I, I know the technology is there. Uh, it's going to take the willpower and uh, the, the willingness to kind of think outside the box and really go after some of these uh, issues to be able to actually achieve a positive ends. Well, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's, it is opening up the imagination of the aerospace uh, industry. I mean, it's never been short of imagination in the past. You know, mm -hmm. I get the sense though, it's, it's a, a little sort of stagnated at the moment in, in its fixation on, you know, rightly on, you know, uh, its own problems at the moment. But it will take, I think you're right, I think it'll take some uh, uh, effort of will and imagination. And I think that's what storytelling does so well is to you know, feed the imagination, allow people to believe, uh, as you've done with your clients in the past, to see where the future is heading and in a positive way. Um, Steve, it, it's been such a great pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for sharing uh, the story of the Lord Transformation and your role in it. Uh, I look forward to working with you in 2021. And just to say, of course, that the story of um, uh, the Lord Transformation, your report on that, uh, will be available uh, on uh, our website, NCW, and probably also on yours too, I imagine. Yes, yes, it will. All right, uh, Steve, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, 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 it's been great talking to you. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Nick.